One of the reasons why I think that these forced birthers want folks to have kids that they know that they can't support or that they don't want is because it fuels that that uh, foster care to human trafficking pipeline. I I don't think that um, these people really want to protect children. So we come to this article. These people, these two, were basically holding their adopted children as slaves. A white couple from rural West Virginia is back behind bars after a judge revoked the initial bond and raised it to half a million apiece more than double the amount they faced last year when police arrested the pair on charges of locking their adopted Black children in a barn and forcing them to work as slaves. Donald Lance, 63, and Jean Whitefeather, 62, both of Sissonville, were ordered to reappear in Kahinwa County Court on June 11th, more than eight months after each posted $200,000 bond following their, their arrest in October. At the time, police conducting a wellness check at the Cheyenne, um, Cheyenne Lane home were shocked to discover two of the couple's five adopted children living in deplorable conditions, padlocked inside a ramshackle storage shed on the back of the property, which had no working lights or running water. The abused children were only identified as a 14-year-old boy and a 16-year-old girl. A third child, um, identified as a 9-year-old girl, was confined to a loft inside the main house and isolated, I'm sorry, away from the presence of the adults and isolated from her other siblings. At the initial court hearing in October, Lance and Whitefeather pleaded not guilty and the Kanawha County Circuit Judge Mary Claire Akers set a bond at $200,000 each. The couple made bail in February and they were released to await trial. They remained free for several months, but in May, a grand jury indicted the couple on more than a dozen new charges, the most serious being human trafficking of a minor child, which prompted the judge to revoke the the lower bond, ordering the couple held in lieu of a million dollars. Along with human trafficking and neglect with serious risk of bodily injuries or death, I don't find the bond to be sufficient, Akers told the defense attorney during the second bond hearing. The upgraded charges included alleged use of a minor child in forced labor, child neglect creating a substantial risk of serious bodily injury or death, as well as false swearing and potential civil rights violations based on color, race, or ancestry, according to court documents. The indictment suggests that three of the five adopted children were Black and that the human rights charges stemmed from those children being specifically targeted and forced to work because of their race. A small toilet seat torn from an RV was placed in the barn for the children to share whenever they had to go to the bathroom. During the second bond hearing, Whitefeather explained that the barn where the children were found was a teenage clubhouse and maintained that the children were not actually locked inside. But neighbors disputed this claim, saying the children were forced to perform farm labor and were not permitted inside the residence, the indictment states. When rescued, the 16-year-old girl informed deputies that they had been locked in the barn for approximately 12 hours and had last eaten around sunrise. According to Burdett, the children locked inside could not exit the shed and deputies had forced themselves, I'm sorry, had to force themselves into the shed. Deputy H.K. Burdett entered the shed and they immediately noticed a disturbing smell and a wave of heat due to lack of circulating air. Both children appeared feral and dirty, reeking of body odor, while the boy had open sores on his bare feet, according to court documents. The children told investigators they were forced to sleep on a bare concrete floor with no mattress or covers. Police remained at the house for three hours before Lance arrived with an 11-year-old boy. When authorities checked the home for other potential victims, they found the nine-year-old holed up in the loft and Lance was placed under arrest. About an hour later, Whitefeather returned home and guided deputies to another six-year-old girl who was visiting with another couple from their church. During the latest bond hearing, Kanawha County prosecutors argued the couple's original cash bonds were likely obtained through trafficking profits, pointing to the fact that the couple produced the $400,000 bond despite a lack of obvious means to do so. At the same proceeding, Lance and Whitefeather claimed they possessed no income or assets, 
raising the question about the sources of the funds for their bond. Anawa County Assistant Prosecuting Attorney Christopher Krivonyak characterized the money posted for the couple's release as contraband directly or indirectly used or intended for use to violate human trafficking laws. In early February, the couple sold an 80-acre ranch in Tonesquet, Washington for $725,000. And days later, White Feather's brother, Marcus Hughes, posted two bonds for $200,000 um, to release the couple from the South Central Regional Jail. Krivonyak said they have since sold the Sissonville home where they were arrested for $295,000. All of those funds have been seized by the court as potential profits from human trafficking, rendering them inaccessible to the defendants. Prosecutors argued that even if the bond money came from legitimate sources, its use was intended to further human trafficking and forced labor operations. Akers also remarked that the case was unlike any she had heard during her entire career as a judge. It alleges human trafficking, human rights violation, and the use of forced labor, Akers said, according to reports. Human rights violations specific to the fact that these children were targeted because of their race and they were basically used as slaves from what the indictment alleges. Both Lance and Whitefeather pleaded not guilty to the new charges in the indictment. However, they remained in jail as they have been unable to meet the higher bond amount. Their next court appearance is scheduled for September 9th. Y'all, when I think of the children that were separated during the Trump administration and then just magically lost into the system, when I think about the kids that are in foster care that get lost or how it's how these, you know, these social workers are purposely overworked and underpaid and how many children get lost in the system. This is one of the reasons why I am very much pro-choice and stop forcing people who you know have no money to have kids. This is the reason why I am very much about birth control and all these forms of contraception because these people want children born so that they can force them into these human trafficking rings. We have this stuff going on in this country but people don't want to talk about it. And we really do need to talk about it. Kids are being used. Kids are being used in all manners of ways. And this is only the tip of the, the iceberg. I hope that they keep unraveling further and further to see where these children were off to. Talking about the, the six-year-old was off with another Christian family. Okay. Okay, they need to dig deeper into this one. Jump in the comments. Let me know what you think. Don't forget to like, comment, and share. So the state of Idaho took it to the Supreme Court that they should be able to let a woman perish versus give her a life-saving pregnancy termination. Idaho, that forced birth their state was like, we demand to be able to let these women just delete delete. They, that's what they want. They took it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court gave their judgment. The U.S. Supreme Court on Thursday in a 6-3 opinion temporarily allows abortions in medical emergencies in Idaho. The opinion was erroneously posted on the court's website on Wednesday. The decision reinstates a lower court ruling that temporarily allows hospitals in the state to perform emergency terminations to protect the life of the mother and the health of the mother. The fact that Idaho took this to the Supreme Court to say that they should be allowed to let women die is wild to me. And it's wild that any women would remain in the state of Idaho. Three of the court's conservatives just um, Chief Justice John Roberts and Justices Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett sided with the three liberals, Justices Elena Kagan, Soda, um, Sonia Sotomayor, and Katanji Brown Jackson in dismissing the appeal from Idaho without considering the court issues in the case. But the Idaho case will no doubt put abortion back in the political limelight as a major controversy just months before the presidential election, and it could alleviate some of the hostility to the court fomented by the decision two years ago overturning Roe v. Wade. Congress passed the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, known as EMTALA, in 1986 to prevent hospitals from refusing care for uninsured patients or dumping them on other hospitals. The law says 
that as a condition for receiving Medicare and Medicaid funds, hospital emergency departments must stabilize a patient whose life or health is at risk. And if the hospital can't do that, it, um, is must, it must transfer the patient to a hospital that can. That was all well and good until the high court overturned Roe. Within weeks, the Biden administration issued guidance to hospitals on how to comply with the emergency care provision under EMTALA. And the Justice Department sued Idaho for barring terminations when a pregnant woman faces an emergency that poses a grave threat to her health, but not an immediate threat to her life. The opinion did not permanently resolve whether Ohio acted within its rights or whether the state law is preempted by EMTALA. Rather, by a 6-3 vote, the court retreated from a previous ruling that had temporarily allowed Idaho's law to take effect, meaning that emergency terminations were illegal in the state if they were to save a mother's health, but not her life. Oh, okay, just let her lose a lot of blood, become septic, get on the verge of death. And then if she's about to die, then maybe you can save her. These people, these forced birthers just, just, why do people, why do ladies, y'all got to stop voting with these people. The opinion dismissed the case as improvidently granted and returned it to the lower courts for further litigation. The case will now return to a federal district court judge who had temporarily blocked the Idaho law from going into effect. We need to make sure that we continue to put these forced birthers and the implications for their rulings front and center. Women and girls need to know and understand that their life is in jeopardy simply being in these states and being of a fertile age because they don't care in these states if a woman has consented at all to being impregnated. They don't care if your health is at risk. They don't care if you have enough money or anything to take care of these babies. They just care about this fetus. They don't care about women and girls. Y'all, if you have the means, you need to get out of these forced birther states. Another case that the Supreme Court ruled on was the opioid settlement. The Supreme Court upsets $10 billion opioid settlement, settlement because it shields the Sacklers. The Supreme Court on Thursday rejected a mass settlement related to the nation's opioid crisis that would have paid an estimated $10 billion to victims, hospitals, states, and others, and shielded the Sackler family from further liability. By a 5-4 vote, the justices ruled that a bankruptcy judge does not have broad power to arrange a mass settlement of thousands of claims that include protections for people who are not bankrupt. The justices were split in an unusual way. Justice um, Neil Gorsuch spoke for the majority, while Justice Chief Justice John Roberts and Justices Soda, Soda, Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Brent Kavanaugh dissented. Our only proper task is to interpret and apply the law as we find it, and nothing in the present law authorizes the Sackler discharge, Gorsuch said. We hold only that the bankruptcy code does not authorize a release and injunction that as part of a plan reorganization under Chapter 11 effectively seeks to discharge claims against a non-debtor without the consent of affected claimants, Gorsuch continued. Justices Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Amy Coney Barrett, and Katanji Brown Jackson agreed. Today's decision is wrong on the law and devastating for more than 100,000 opioid victims and their families, Kavanaugh said in dissent. The court's decision rewrites the text of the U.S. Bank bankruptcy code and restricts the long-established authority of bankruptcy courts to fashion fair and equitable relief for mass tort victims. As a result, opioid victims are now deprived of the substantial monetary recovery that they long fought for and finally secured after years of litigation. Gorsuch and Kavanaugh are both conservatives, but they often disagree. Gorsuch often seems determined to follow the law as he sees it regardless of the consequences, while Kavanaugh is more likely to focus on the practical impact of the court's ruling. The Sacklers, owners of the Purdue Pharma Company, had denied wrongdoing but agreed to contribute to uh, contribute $6 billion to the settlement fund if they were protected from future lawsuits. The case has been closely followed, not just because of the opioid settlement, but also because of the use of bankruptcy laws to settle other mass lawsuits, 
involving the Boy Scouts of America and some Catholic dioceses. Purdue Pharma filed for bankruptcy in 2019, facing thousands of lawsuits alleging its marketing of Oxycontin as a non-addictive pain relief pill had triggered an opioid epidemic that led to more than half a million deaths since the mid-1990s. In the decade prior to the bankruptcy, the company had distributed about $11 billion to members of the Sackler family and their offshore accounts. Their, their lawyers maintained that more than half of this amount was paid in taxes, but the scale of the damage and the liability for OxyContin was extraordinary. A bankruptcy court later put a hold on new lawsuits, while pending claims against the Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers was, um, were estimated to seek in total more than $40 trillion. A coalition of creditors, including victims, hospitals, local and state governments, and tribal nations, negotiated a settlement that was expected to pay out about $10 billion. Most of the funding, about $6, million, $6 billion, came from the Sacklers. In 2021, a bankruptcy judge approved the settlement and described it as the only reasonable, conceivable way to fairly resolve the mass of lawsuits. Without the money from the Sacklers, he said the company would be liquidated, leaving most of the creditors with nothing. While more than 95% of the creditors say they approve the deal, including all 50 states, the Biden administration's bankruptcy trustee opposed it. He did so because the settlement shielded the Sacklers from any further future liability. In the Harrington v. Pharma, um, Purdue Pharma, the trustee argued that the Sacklers were not bankrupt and therefore cannot take advantage of the shield provided by a bankruptcy settlement. Last year, the Supreme Court put the settlement on hold to consider that argument. To me, this sounds like nobody is particularly happy, but I am not a legal scholar, so I do not really understand the implication of this and if any of the victims will get any money, if there will be any relief from the creditors. So someone who understands a little bit more about what is going on, please chime in and comment. Uh, let us know what is going on here? What did the what did what is it that the courts are saying? Will they have to pay that six billion dollars that they said or what? Jump in the comments, let me know, like, comment, share.